Welcome to the 62nd Annual Sidewalk Art Show. We're coming to you virtually from the Tama Museum of Art in downtown Roanoke. This event is presented by American National Bank and Trust with lead sponsorship by Blue Ridge Beverage and additional support by Lindor Arts. I'm Cindy Peterson, the museum's executive director. And I'm Holly DeGange, deputy director for development. Over the past six decades, the annual Sidewalk Art Show has become a beloved tradition for our region. The art show originated by the museum's first paid executive director, Barbara Dickinson, and I know she comes every year to enjoy the show. She was inspired by the outdoor art shows in Alexandria, Virginia, near her hometown. Along with key founding community members composed of artists, art advocates, and business leaders, the show began in 1959, just 30 artists right outside on the Roanoke uh, Library patio. And that continued to grow. It moved to Kirk Avenue, then Elmwood Park, and now it's on the downtown streets of Roanoke, exhibiting over 120 artists from across the country. As traditions sometimes evolve, we're excited to offer this experience to you in a new form. Tune in today and tomorrow for a more intimate experience. We'll connect you with artists for an insider's peek into their studios and galleries and homes through demonstrations, Q&As, studio tours, and more. This is your opportunity to hear from them directly on their process, inspiration, and new projects they're working on. And throughout the show, we'll also offer our Museum Minutes, where Holly and I will take you throughout the museum to get spotlights of exhibitions. And if you wish to come in to see these works in person, we have reopened our doors since the beginning of July. We're open on Fridays and Saturdays, 10 to 5, and Sundays, 12 to 5. And of course, we have free general admission sponsored by AEP Foundation. So we look forward to seeing you on site as well as virtually for the Sidewalk Art Show. And through our partnership with our lead sponsor, Blue Ridge Beverage, during these museum minutes, we'll offer guided tastings of some of the best breweries and vineyards in our region. Support local and check our agenda in advance so you can follow along. Throughout the show, we'll share six tastings led by winemakers, brewers, and tasting room managers. And we encourage you also to visit the online shop component of this fundraiser, shop.taubmanmuseum.org, where many of our artists featured this weekend have listed their work. All sales benefit the artist and the museum, and we appreciate that you browse and hopefully find something to take home with you, and that benefits artists and museum during this critical time. And we want to hear from you, so if you like what you're seeing or if you have a question, our artists are tuning in live so they can answer anything you have, so just type that in and also share with your friends and invite them to the Sidewalk Art Show party. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual Sidewalk Art Show. Enjoy. All right, so I start with a bunch of paint on the back of the knife and I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself not so much sky and more of the water in the front. So here we go. That's that little pumic. Now I'm gonna get some other green. A uh, thing about the knife is it's not very exact. It's not very exacting, and I I love that about it. So I, what uh, what made you change from using brushes to uh, knives? <laughs> I was uh, painting with a, I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught, but I did paint for a while with a, a group called the Walk Hill River School, and they were plain air painters, and th these people were great. They answered all of my questions, and you know, what am I doing wrong, and why isn't this painting working? And we were painting, um, I was using a brush, but we were painting the Hamilton Fish Bridge in Newburgh, New York still have the painting and I was painting I mean every girder and bolt and you name it every wave crest and white head and white cap and I just was killing this painting with detail and I looked at this thing and I thought Ugh, if this is how I'm going to paint I'm just not going to paint anymore and I had seen a guy well I watched Bob Ross when I was a kid 
Uh, we were just talking about Bob Ross. <laughs> Bob Ross. Bob Ross is great. I can put some happy little clouds in here for you. Yes. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, but I had, I had seen a guy at the Walker River School um, do a demo with a palette knife and I thought, aha, free me from the tyranny of detail. And I picked it up and I have never looked back. Um, you know, if I need a brush, I use a brush, but most times I don't, I don't need a brush. No. My paintings, uh, I like to leave room for the viewer to put their own experience in my paintings, to wonder, you know, what's beyond that curve or why is that little white line there? Well, it's there because first of all, it went on there by accident. And secondly, I like it. So <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of what Bob Ross used to call the happy accident. Uh, big fan. What made you start using black um, canvases? Uh, I, I, I ran into a black canvas, an already black canvas um, in an art supply store. And I am, I am a big experimenter. I, I try stuff all the time. I try different colors. I try different approaches. Um, and I saw this black canvas and I thought, oh, well, that's an interesting idea. And so I picked it up and um, and I just really love, loved a lot of things about it. Um, the first ones I did, I left pretty large Martin black, black edges, like almost that big. Um, and I, cause I love the way that the black uh, sort of frames itself, you know, gives you a frame. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I really like the way that the colors uh, bounce. I, I think it makes, I think it makes the colors deeper. It unifies the paint. Do you get a lot of custom work um, for like people's dogs and stuff? I do. Yeah, I, and I do. Uh, I'm, I'm in the, I finally finished, took three years, but a project called um, 101 Dogs, because that's what I painted. Uh, and, and in the, the midst of making that into a, a book. So I painted 101 people's dogs. Um, and yeah, I'm making it into a book or a calendar or a poster, or they can have whatever of those they want. And, um, I'm, you know, I still do plenty of dog portraits. I love, I love dogs. when somebody says, I've never bought, they almost always say real art. And, you know, I know what they mean. Yeah. Uh, not from Target. Or, uh, <laughs> not, home, not Home Depot. What's that? Home Goods. Yeah, Home Goods. <laughs> right. Not from Home Goods. Like, you know, I get it. I get it. And I, 
I, uh, I, I, I love that those people put their, their trust in me and that they're, they're willing to part with money that they worked really hard to earn for one of my Preference of um, painting animals over landscapes or landscape over animals? That's a really good question. Um, my very favorite thing to do in the whole world is to go to a place I've never been before and fall in love with it and paint it. So I guess that says landscapes. Um, but I'm very, very happy painting animals. And when, when Peter died, I, I, I realized at that point we had five dogs. I've, I've given one of them to uh, my daughter. Um, and, but I realized that this was before the COVID, that I wasn't going to be able to do shows because, or at least not the way I used to do them. I used to do 18, 18 or 20 shows a year. And um, I would go off and he'd stay here and deal with the dogs. Well, um, so I, you know, I, I really just didn't know how I was gonna live, how I was gonna make a living, how I was gonna, you know, could I still be an artist? Can I, you know, I've been talking for years about moving more of my stuff online and, you know, looks like now I better do that. It's time, so I, um, came up with uh, what, I'm, what I've called a bird a day. And uh, so since uh, December of last year, I, I also, in addition to all those other websites, I have a blog, which is carriejacobson.blogspot.com, the accidental artist. Mm -hmm. Since, since uh, yeah, like December of last year, I've painted and posted um, a, a five inch by seven inch bird painting almost every day, about five days a week. And they generally sell for $68 and that includes shipping. I've sold pretty much all of them. Um, so that has, so in a way, you know, animals, birds um, have kind of given me a way to live at a very, you know, they've given me answers and a way to make a living at a very hard time in my life. Um, and then the dogs, I still have the four dogs. Um, there are a lot of days when if I didn't have these dogs, I probably wouldn't have gotten out of bed. But you know, you got dogs and they require food and you know, they gotta go out and and they would like you to celebrate every moment of the day with them. So yeah. They are such happy creatures. <laughs> yeah, and so and I love painting people's dogs too. Um so you know I kinda kinda love it all. Well, this has been so exciting to see you painting your work and, and showing us your creative process and everything. And, you know, we are just um, 
we're glad that we got the chance to talk with you and learn more about you and your background. So is there anything else that you want your viewers to know about your work? You don't have to be, art doesn't have to be scary. Art is, art is, in my mind, art is hopeful. Art is a window into um, beauty and optimism. And it's, you know, you don't have to know everything to love art. Just know what you love. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, that bit yeah. with us. So you can browse Carrie's work on her Facebook page at Carrie Jacobson Artist and her Instagram at Carrie B. Jacobson and also on her website at jacobson-arts.com. I've been focused on making functional pottery for about eight to ten years now, but I actually start off as a sculptor. So I first got into ceramics at Ohio University, where I thought I was going to study photography, but I took clay class, ended up falling in love with it, and really focused on ceramic sculpture for the first four to six years of my, my time as a student and a professional artist. So um, at the time, I, because it was a liberal arts university, I was also taking a lot of science classes and classes in other subjects, and I really fell in love with botany and environmental sciences, so that's been a big source of inspiration for me. My early sculpture work was very focused around environmental problems, and oftentimes they took the form of botanical sculptures that were talking about problems around botanical ecosystems, and over time, as I started uh, making a living as an artist after I graduated, I ended up teaching a lot of pottery classes because I wanted to learn to work on the wheel and fell in love with vessels again. So um, at this point, I'm still inspired by botany, but I've become a little bit more interested in the way that floral and botanical patterns and decor have become somewhat of a surrogate natural experience in our homes. So I've been studying the evolution of different floral symbols throughout history especially in textile design and seeing how if you go far enough back, a lot of those very stylized flowers can actually reference real plants. And then through kind of their own natural uh, evolution, they've been naturally selected by different consumers and designers and spread around the world and reinterpreted by different cultures. So that, that's kind of where my focus is now. I, I really love historic textiles from India. That's my favorite region to study. Oh, very nice. Do you ever find that you focus more on a type of flower that was, you know, used in patterns, you know, in a certain time period? Yeah, I, I really like looking at the 1600s and 1700s. Uh, again, I told you India is my favorite region. That's kind of an interesting time because it's when you start having globalization hit India and a lot of those patterns that start off being very traditional and lifelike um, referencing very specific plants were suddenly being influenced by European buyers who would come in and say, hey, I love that. I'd buy 500 next time, but could you make it purple and a little more squirrely because that sold better? And all of a sudden, within a couple hundred years, you have this translation from literal plant to something as abstracted as paisley, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty interesting to learn about. So can you tell us more about the your process? Sure. Yeah, so all my pots begin on the wheel. A lot of my throne forms are what we call thrown and altered in the world of ceramics where I might start with a piece on the wheel but then it ends up being squished into an oval or a different shape or maybe it's thrown without a base and I end up turning those walls into an oval and put a new slab under it. So there's a lot of alteration but after that all my pieces stiffen up for about 12 hours or so before being carved. So I have a little example I pulled out here. This is just a simple vase, but um, I'm not sure how well you can see. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, after stiffening up a little bit, I go in and I carve all the pattern work into the pieces. And these are all carved by hand. I'm not using stamps or stencils. And I can show you that most of the carving is done with tools like this. Here, let me hold my hand up behind it, see if you can see a little better. It's just a basic loop tool with a nice sharp top corner on it so it allows me to scoop out those lines and then later after the piece is done through the kiln the first time I come in with colored glaze and I inlay it into the carved lines and the piece gets fired again in the kiln so I make the vast majority of my glazes they're my own recipes and I 
use entirely food safe materials. So my goal is to make really ornate pieces, but still make pieces that truly are functional and will hold up mm -hmm. well so that you can use them for everyday use in your kitchen. So um, my studio is actually in a former garage. It's this little detached building that's back behind my house. I live in a historic neighborhood in Nashville, just west of downtown. So that way, about 10 minutes by car is downtown Nashville. <laughs> it's great. I get to walk out my back door every morning and come to my studio. And I've renovated the space quite a bit since we first bought the house. So um, I'll kind of give you a general tour so you can get the lay of the land. Then I'll explain what's what. It's not a huge space, but as you can see, I'm starting to really fill it up. So um, in the middle of my studio here, you can see my pottery wheels. I have two wheels because I do teach private lessons and I also, depending on what I'm doing, sometimes we'll have different pieces on different wheels, like one will be set up for trimming, one will be set up for throwing. Um, but this is where most pieces start. And then when they dry and I do that carving process I mentioned, that takes place over here in this little corner. And then my kiln right here, it's a big electric kiln in case you've never seen inside one of these. It's kind of like a giant toaster oven. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, fill this up with work and those elements in the side get really nice and hot. It's run by a computer here because you can't just hit go. Unlike a toaster oven, you have to be really specific about how quickly the kiln goes through different temperature ranges. Mm -hmm. Over here you can see some works in progress and um, sorry I don't have any pots fresh off the wheel today but you can see some pieces that were thrown last week that have been assembled and carved. So for example this big piece is actually a jar and you can see all the carved ornamentation on it. And then I have another piece I'll show you here. This is a, a big fancy bowl. <laughs> so right now during COVID, since my sh show schedule slowed down a little bit, I've been playing with a lot of new forms. I also am working towards a solo museum show I have in uh, January at the Customs House Museum here in Middle Tennessee. So that's what a lot of these kind of more ornate forms are for. Nice. Um, this is my pottery storage, which I realize looks a little precarious, but um, if I were able to come out and do the show this weekend, this would be the inventory that comes out. But you can see I make everything from cups and mugs all the way to more ornate forms like teapots and pitchers. Uh, and I have, I have a lot of pottery right now. <laughs> um, this side of the room is where a lot of the pieces get finished. So I have my glazing corner, all those buckets are full of glaze. And if, if you're new to ceramics, I'll show you real quick. One of the interesting things about glaze is that it's a lot of chemistry. So if you're the kind of person who enjoys being creative, but you also like science, you might love trying ceramics. So um, as an example here, this is a dark blue glaze. And if you see inside, it looks kind of watery. That glaze, the colorant in it is cobalt. And when it gets hot, and gets fired in the kiln, it will actually become the dark blue on this first piece I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the challenge. You're applying glaze, which you can see on some pieces here that I've been working on today. You're applying glaze, but you have to know your glazes well enough to imagine what the results will get because just because something looks gray right now that doesn't mean it's going to turn out gray it might turn out purple for all you know mm -hmm. so here are more works in progress this is a big piece that's been fired i'm sorry the lighting's not great here oh wow but you can see i work in a range of scales um, and all my glazes are actually applied with these little squirt bottles nice. um last of all people get a kick out of this i actually made my own sink <laughs> because the one thing the space was lacking was plumbing. So this has a faucet that's connected to my hose line and then it drains into a bucket down here which is on wheels so I can just dump in the side yard because it's just mud water. I'm real careful about why I wash down there. So I wanted to let viewers know you can browse Audrey's work on Instagram and Facebook at Audrey Deal McEver Art and on her website at AudreyDealMcEver.com.
you who have been to the studio before, welcome back. Good to have you. Those of you who have not been here before, welcome. Uh, you probably don't know me or my work, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you're going to see. The first thing you're going to see probably uh, is that I'm a storyteller. I'm a narrative painter, and um, I love telling those stories, but I try to do it with style, with expressive brush stroke. And you'll notice a very patterned aesthetic in the studio behind me, but that also shows up in my paintings as well. And you're going to see a lot of diagonals used in the paintings because to me, uh, I want motion no matter what subject I'm portraying, I like motion. And the way to do that usually is by slicing diagonals through the rectangle of the image. We're gonna see now some sketches as well as some other watercolors in progress. Uh, these things have been up here a couple of years actually, but I have not totally finished them. I'm still looking at them. But I wanna show you some of the work. All of the work comes from sketches. We'll talk about the sketches first. Now you see everything in the world here from the Salem Rodeo, and that's hard to sketch because everything's in motion. You have eight seconds to get that guy on that bull. <laughs> well, you've but captured actually, you wait, it. Well, you wait for the next guy on the next bull and you just find commonalities in their poses. Uh, but this is us riding bikes under a street light when we were little. Here's the Chicago River when I went up there to see the Art Institute and learn from those paintings. These are the oldsters walking in Italy. Mm. At night, everybody takes the passeggiata, and it's so wonderful to see these old men and women walking. It just means a lot to me to, to be there to sketch them. We saw a minute ago that little watercolor from Florence that was off of this sketch. Oh, yes. Right there. Which it seems like, you know, as we go through this, this is over years and years, um, Eric, in terms of, you know, what, what your sketchbooks have you know, you've collected and, and but you, you keep laying them out in, in terms of that inspiration and going back to it. Is that correct? That, that is totally correct. And I, I keep thumbing through them and sooner or later, one will speak to you like, yep, got to do something with that. That's, that's worth doing. Not every sketch will turn into a painting, obviously, and not every right. sketch is uh, worthy of chasing, but some do. And you'll see this downstairs. This is Times Square. And it's interesting to note that this was done completely from memory on the bus on the way back to Roanoke on an art tour. Wow. Some of your best sketching comes from memory because you only put down the things that are really important to you. Everything else is faded. This is a guy, this was good practice too, sketching a flat footing guy up in Galax. That was fun. And then here's Bar Harbor. The Bar Harbor Inn had all these wonderful people on the beach. And obviously, they're all moving all the time. So you're grabbing various people, uh, trying to get them as they come in and out of the picture. You choose the interesting ones. You don't worry about the boring ones. And you try to arrange them in a way that uh, does them justice. Now, speaking of Bar Harbor, let's look at a couple of pieces from Bar Harbor. Near that Bar Harbor Inn is Balance Rock, which was a glacial erratic brought 60 miles down and deposited by a glacier. Mm. And so it's still there, it's sort of fascinating, and that's what it looks like at dawn. Watercolor is so good for catching atmosphere, especially the fog bank moving in. Look at that wet sky, that's just perfect for watercolor. And yet the dry portion of watercolor, you actually squeeze all the, the color out of the brush and you scrape the brush over on its side and it skips across the page. The page has a tooth to it, is what they call it. A lot of bumps, basically. Wow, and I can I can I can visualize that skipping, you know, and that, yeah. that movement and and the texture, the texture that right. you can and see. Right, and the good part is the the when you do that dry brush thing with that textured paper, um, the color stays on the ridges and nothing happens in the valleys, and that's why you have that wonderful sparkle going on. This is a neat one too. This is a Sand Beach again, out in the distance, a breaker there on Great Head, and. Uh, a very moody gray day though, and I thought this captured it very, very well. Fog though, we were talking about fog and how hard it is to paint. There's a very successful one of a person and their dog walking along the shore walk in Bar Harbor. And isn't watercolor just perfect to get this atmospheric effect? Oh yeah. I mean, I can't imagine painting it uh, in anything else that would would do so well. And that's, that's an answer to Buster's question again. Buster, when I was gonna paint fog, I just knew it had to be watercolor. That was the way to approach it. Now, in watercolor, you usually have no white paint. This is the white of the paper behind that rock in Bailey Island. This is painted on location. Mm -hmm. And so 
you think about it, you have to think in reverse for a second. You have to paint everything but the wave. And that happens in uh, clouds and skies. So you paint the sky and not the cloud if, this, if the cloud's going to be white. So let's look again. We were talking about how sketches are the genesis of all of this. Look at that sketch right there, if you will. This was done uh, on Monhegan. And then the painting that came from it is right there. Wow. It's a direct translation, as you can see. And the one thing I think it's interesting to know about it, it didn't come from a, a hallowed past. I was uh, in a place called the Trailing U. They had a communal bathroom down the hall. So several times during the night, I would see this thing. But there were no lights on. So when I went to paint it, the yellow green island was the thing. That was what it stood out the night before when I looked out the window. So I thought, well, artistic license. I could put yellow green lights on in that house. And then I can put orange. And then I have the secondary triad of purple and, and green and orange. Well, and, and Eric, I think yeah. this, is, this would be a great time to show uh, some of the, the, we have two photos from your time in Maine. And it just, you know, brings sure. to life these that you, you know, worked out, worked on plein air as you were describing them. So Laura, if you oh, could man, share. Oh man, that'd be great. Yeah, we, oh, we're yeah, sharing that's... the Arcadia, Maine, right? Yes, and that is near Thunder Hole where the waves are just tremendous. I was perched right on the side of a cliff and I had to watch, you know, usually back up and look at a painting. I had to watch the back up <laughs> right there on the rocks. Oh, that's just gorgeous to be there too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that is along the Great Head Trail. I was hiking. I have a backpack that carries all the watercolor supplies. And so uh, you just prop it up against the tree and paint right there. What a joy though, because again, the surf was incredible that day. Huge surf. Oh, you can see, I mean, you can see it from your painting. Yeah, you can see yes. that surf coming in, yeah. And you feel like you're doing everything you can to try to capture uh, almost something that's uncapturable, the, the beauty, the vastness of Maine. It's a challenge for an artist. You just do the best you can and know that you'll fall short, but whatever you do will be such a joy to do that uh, you just do your best with it. The third floor of the museum is a visitor favorite to see works of art on view, but also visitor balcony. Right here we have Eric Stanley, artist and professor, and this work of art, A Lesson of Atticus. And 2019, 34 layers. And if you get up close, you can really see that layer by layer of PVC and paper, that intricacy. We just had a studio visit virtually with Eric, and you could see how he worked in his process from the notebooks and the sketches over years for those patterns, and you see those patterns here, as well as um, the, the machines that he uses in order to laser cut. This is a special one because it is on loan, and we worked with students as they installed it here on site. And again, 34 layers, that intricate pattern, and um, you know, a favorite to just continue to explore. And with us today is Brian Summerson from Big Lick Brewery, president and head brewer. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. So tell us a little bit about Big Lick Brewing Company before we um, head to the tastings. Okay, we're actually right up the street here from you, a couple blocks on 409 Salem Avenue. Um, we're in a newly developed area, uh, which actually leads me to our first beer, which is called West Station Pilsner. And where we're located is actually the West Station neighborhood. Um, so we named the beer after it. Um, it is a Czech style Pilsner. So it's very, very light, um, mm -hmm. has a decent amount of bitterness. Um, Saws hops, which are European, kind of spicy. Um, good pairing with all sorts of different foods. Mm -hmm. good, yeah, definitely. Good fishing beer. Light, <laughs> a good fishing beer, light, <laughs> and um, like you said, so that, that hops fill. Correct. Okay, and I know at your establishment you can sit outside or inside. You can, yes. So, we have which a, is wonderful during this, uh, this timing. So yeah. if it's raining, you can jump inside, Correct. and if it's beautiful weather, it can mm -hmm. be outside. Correct. And the second one here? That's called Scatter Kindness. It's an American pale ale. It is um, what we call a hazy pale ale, so it has a lot of adjuncts wheat for this particular mm -hmm. one. That's what leads to the cloudiness, but also has a little softer mouthfeel and mm -hmm. um, not real bitter, but lots of hops. Pop flavor and aroma. 
Yeah, and a little bit of a citrus. Yes. So that, that refreshing that for, for summertime. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me a little bit about this this intricate design here. So that art and design mm -hmm. as what well, you know going with the with the brewery. Yeah, that's a local artist um, I discovered on Facebook um, mm -hmm. off of a concert poster. Um, a student I taught when I used to teach, and I got in touch with him, and I told him I liked the artwork, and he put me in touch with her, Mary Beth Lee, and she was very excited, and she's designed all our labels um, since that was the first. Great. And probably six labels since, including the next beer. Wonderful. Let's go on to the, to the third. <laughs> um, next beer is called Shabby Chic, and it is a double IPA. Once again, it's also a hazy double IPA. Mm -hmm. that, that's the in thing right now, so not a lot of bitterness, a little softer on the mouthfeel. Once again, juicy with the notes of orange. And yeah, it, is, it has that kind of an orangey feel. Mm -hmm. You're right, mm -hmm. juicy, not as um, you know, a little bit light yep. for summer. Yeah, and it's it does have a good amount of alcohol in it, but you you can't kind of sneaks up on you. You can't yeah. tell it's in it. And tell me about you know we've got a number of other you know options as people come to yep. Big Lake Brewing either to stop in or curbside delivery yep. is is a is a possibility. Yes, especially in, in this time we've that's kind of what kept us afloat during the rough times there we had right. um, to go and curbside pickup. Um, phase three you can now get growlers filled so we can fill up pretty much anything we have in a growler. Uh, we also do four packs of lots of things, not everything but most everything. And then these are called a crowler. This is basically two 16 ounce cans in one. And we do that on anything we have in, on tap, including seltzers. Which well, we, tell me a little bit about the seltzer. I'm, I'm interested mm -hmm. and intrigued. I know, you know, that's a good pairing if you have husband and wife that drink different things. Yep, and it's, uh, as a brewer, I, I was hesitant <laughs> to do a seltzer, but, but it's really opened up a new market for us. And like you said, it's, it's brought in a lot more couples and folks who wouldn't normally come to the brewery can now get um, seltzers, they're very excited about it. And started out small, small batches, and now we're, we've recently done a large batch, which should last longer than a week, we hope. <laughs> Great, well, thank you, Brian. You're I welcome. look forward to visiting Big Lick Brewing Company with friends and, and picking up a growler as well as a, a crawler. Great. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So joining us now is photographer Robert Schultz, uh, an artist based out of Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, we're joining him in a studio space today. So thank you for joining us and welcome, Robert. Thank you. So we are excited because you are going to kind of walk us through your creative process. Um, so I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. Sure. Well, I do artists' books, photography, and um, chlorophyll prints, which is developing photography in the flesh of leaves. And uh, because the things that I'm showing in the, in the sale are, are my specimen scans, the, those photographs, I'll run through that. And um, I'll show you a couple of samples to begin with. Um, these are things that I find in the garden. Um, my wife is quite a gardener, we work together and I, um, put the specimens onto the bed of my scanner and I leave the lid off and I turn out the lights and we get deep back black uh, backgrounds. So this is the kind of work that um, I'm gonna demonstrate. This is a dandelion, I mean a uh, milkweed pod going to seed and I'll show you the, um, the example of the work that's going to be in the Homeward Bound exhibition at the Taubman. Oh, nice. the, uh, magnolia uh, seed pod with yeah. uh, some background materials. So this is, um, I thought I'd just show you too, since I mentioned the um, artist book and the um, chlorophyll prints. Oh, wow. This, this is a, a simple uh, folder with a poem in it and a chlorophyll print developed in a hosta leaf uh, from the garden. This is a Confederate soldier and the poem is about uh, a Civil War experience. So with that as introduction, um, I can take you into the next room where the scanner is located 
and we can see how this is actually done, okay? The, the way that you're doing these scans is your, um, your like cameraless photography. Yes, uh, the scanner is, is the camera in this case, and the, the photograph is taken from below. Uh, it's, it's like a scanner that people might have at home in their all-in-one, their printer, copier, scanner. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a very simple process, and, and it's a lot of fun, and I encourage people to give it a try. Yeah. So uh, these are specimen scans, so I go out and browse around and, and see what interests me. Today, I um, have uh, some of these yellow Mexican marigolds and some ferny thing that I don't know the name of. <laughs> so it's, it's a matter of just placing these on the scanner bed. And, you know, I, I try and keep my head out of it at first and just use my eyes and hands and uh, put things on the bed and then do a, uh, a sample scan to see what it looks like. And then uh, if I need to push things around or rearrange, then I will uh, be able to do that before I do the high resolution scan. So I actually turn out the lights. And uh, I'll run a, a low resolution preview scan. Yeah, I just love how your work has like such amazing clarity to it, but it's also got this really soft, um, the it's softness to it that's almost like they're frozen in time. Um, well, the, the scanner gives you a, an interesting effect because it's not really meant for this. It's mm -hmm. meant for flat objects. It has a very narrow depth of field. And so when you adjust contrasts, and so forth, you get a tiny depth of field. So, so the, some of the parts of the image seem to recede into this deep black background. But I did invest in a, in a high-end 17 by 12 bed scanner and I have a good printer. So, um, you know, this, this ups the quality of the final process. And I do my own printing on a, a, a professional Canon printer. So, you know, all these details add to the um, end result. So once I've done this, maybe you can see on the computer monitor, we've got the... Um, oh, wow. And, oh, that's uh, beautiful. That's the preliminary scan. And then eventually I can... Uh, show you something closer to the final scan. I don't know what type of fern that is, but it looks so feathery. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what it's called. I always have to consult with my wife and get the <laughs> uh, She's a real gardener. And these are very high resolution scans because sometimes I like to print these really big. And so um, you, can, you can see that you've got a lot so, of very high resolution image and I can print very large and um, that's an important piece of, of this process as well. I love the pairing of the color of the flowers with that fern. It's a really great composition there. Well the garden's filled with possibilities and while sheltering at home during this pandemic time we're fortunate that we have an acre and that my wife is what a, such a prolific gardener. I've basically scanned something every day just to make a record of what's blooming. And yeah, yeah. It's a good way to keep track of it. Well, <laughs> I believe- be like, what did we have in the garden last year? <laughs> exactly, plus I've, I'm writing little reflections and I may make an artist book called Specimens of the Plague Spring. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So they would, would pair short meditations with uh, whatever's blooming that particular day. Uh, this is my writing desk. And there is just a little bit of post-production here. 
to adjust contrast to, I can deepen the backgrounds a little bit. I can make small repairs on Photoshop. And um, then, uh, then I think, you know, it's pretty much ready to, to print and there's the printer. So, so it's sort of a, a three station process um, as, as I hope you, you, you can infer from what we've just done. Well, this has been such a treat to see your space and learn more about your process. And um, is there anything else that you would like the viewers to know about your work? Well, I'm excited in that I've just acquired gallery representation by uh, Chroma Projects, uh, curated by the wonderful Deborah McLeod in Charlottesville. And I'm branching out, um, I'm making I have a social um, media following and people have asked me to make prints and to uh, make art cards. And so I'm, I'm going to production mode a little bit and making these things available to people on, on request. Well, that sounds great. So we'll be seeing more of your work. <laughs> Soon, I'm yeah. doing it. Yes. So I just want to let the viewers know you can browse Robert's work on his website. Um, robertschultz.com, also on Facebook and Instagram at Robert Schultz Photo. And you can also purchase his work through the Taubman Museum of Arts online art sale. That's at shop.taubmanmuseum.org. And half of the sales support the museum, and it will be up through August 31st. Um, thank you again, Robert. It has been such a treat. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your work with us. Thank you. So I'm here with painter Leah Thompson, and we are joining her in her studio today in Roanoke, Virginia. So thanks for joining us, uh, and welcome, Leah. Thank you. So your paintings are just so colorful and have you know, such nice movement to them. Can you tell us more about your process? Well, I, um, fun, it's funny, I, I, I started out not using color at all when I went to college, which is odd. But then I became really uh, interested in color and, so, and, and layering. So I like how colors interact with each other. So um, my process really is, for, I actually start with the drawing first and then add color to it. And then I kind of go back and forth between color, uh, coloring the subject and coloring the background and, and, and just kind of weaving those things, two things together. So you say that you, you know, you do a lot of layering. So, um, you know, how, how does that process look like that? Do you spend one day just working on multiple pieces where you just kind of put that first layer down or do you really just stick with that one piece and you kind of focus on that? Like, how, how does that process work for you? Okay, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a detail-oriented person. I'm one of those people that just once I, I, get, I get bored very easily. So I uh, do several paintings at one time. And yes, that's what I do. I do several layers at one uh, of different pictures at one time. And then I go back after a few days and go back again and just keep on going back um, between paintings until I feel that they have reached a place that I'm satisfied with. So I know you do a lot of paintings of dancers. Um, do you have a background in dance? I don't have a background in dance at all. <laughs> Um, I just love the work of Degas. This is one of his paintings behind me on the poster. Um, when he was older, he became uh, more blind. And so in order to see the artwork, he had to use more vivid colors. And I just really fell in love with those vivid colors. And since he did paintings of dancers, I also wanted to start there. So I just started painting dancers and people liked them. So I just did more dancers and more dancers. And then I added my whole color thing in with it. Nice. Do you ever go um, to the ballet here in Roanoke and, and sit and draw the dancers? Um, a few years ago I did. I went to, I think Salem, some uh, art studio in Salem. And uh, I was given permission to, to sit in and watch them dance. And I drew a lot of pictures from that, so. 
Um, I tend to redo the same images over and over again in my painting. So once I have it drawn, I might actually go back. It might be as soon as I finish drawing it. Um, other times it's years later. <laughs> gotcha. And where else do you find inspiration? You know, for you know other topics. Do you? I know you focus on dancers, but what other what other subjects do you like to paint? I like to paint people. Um, I am not originally from Roanoke, Virginia. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was born and raised there, and um, we didn't have mountains in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I really focused on people. And when I got here, that didn't really change. So I continued to just draw people. I would get on the bus. One time I rode, I rode on the bus for like two, three hours, um, just drawing people. Um, I go into restaurants, draw people. I go to, to malls, draw people. I just like the, the activity of uh, people and, and, and as they're going in shopping or doing whatever they're doing, just kind of living life. Have you dabbled in other types of media? I know, I know that you started with drawing and, and you still use drawing, um, you know, with your painting, but have you, have you tried any other types of media? Um, originally, actually, I started in watercolor. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how did, how did you make that switch? <laughs> well, it wasn't my idea. Um, I was, uh, I, I went to Penn State University and in order to get to the fine arts the program, you had to do oil. And I only did watercolor. However, I did get in to the fine arts program on my watercolors. But, oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that was the first time that's ever happened. But um, they said, if you wanna stay in our program, you have to go with oil. So that's what I did, I just went with oil. So mm -hmm. ever since oil, I loved oil, so. Yeah, <laughs> it seems like, uh, you know, a, a positive transition there. But, you know, it's interesting you say that because your work does almost look like watercolor paintings. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that you kind of, you still have that same, that still, same kind of style and look of a watercolor, but you're using, mm -hmm. you know, the oil. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. I also use the, um, the transparency of, of the idea of transparency. So sometimes my colors actually are just uh, transparent so you can see through the other layers and yeah. I watercolor. Yeah, well, that's really cool. So um, we would love to see some of your work and I know that we're in your studio. So um, do you mind just sharing a little bit of, of your space? Not at all. All right, um, this painting back here, um, this is one of my smaller paintings and this is what I was talking about. If um, it is a picture uh, at a market so this is um, uh, one of my small pictures of that. I must, I've, I think I've probably used this figure about four, four or five different paintings, but um, I like, kind of like Picasso, he does the same mm -hmm. thing as uh, a drawing and he'll use that drawing in many different paintings. Um, I have a whole bunch of like, it's upside down. I have a whole bunch of uh, sketchbooks with drawings just, very quick drawings of people. I don't mm -hmm. really drawing people that are just standing still like they're trying to take a picture. I more enjoy people um, in their element, just walking around and doing. I like the brevity of life. I don't want it to be posed looking. Mm -hmm. I just use those drawings over and over and over and over again in different paintings. Um, the painting I'm working on right now um, is this one here. Oh, wow, it's beautiful. Thank you. And this painting is actually from um, a really old um, sketchbook. That, that's me in college. So <laughs> that's <Yeah. laughs> really old picture. Um, so like I never throw away my sketchbooks because I often go back and use it. Sometimes in my paintings that I do of people in Roanoke, some people, some of the people in that picture, actually people from Philadelphia, nobody knows the name. Um, when I was younger, I did a lot of pictures of um, homeless people. I think mostly, I could say it's probably really, you know, because they're, you know, I like their stories, but also because they hang around a lot. So it's really easy <laughs> to draw them. They're not moving in like everybody yeah. else is. So this is one of my paintings. Um, I call this one the library. And uh, a lot of homeless people hang out in the library. So 
all those people are probably just regular people, but the guy that's laying on the side there, he's actually laying on the other side of the window um, of the library. So uh, he's outside, but yeah, that's a homeless person. So um, I, have a, I have a heart for the homeless people, I guess. Um, like I, they, they don't mind me drawing them, but I also like hearing their stories. Um, um, in Philadelphia, when it gets really cold, uh, they, they allow the homeless people to stand in like the train stations and stuff like that. And one time I went in there and drew them in the train station. So I have a lot of drawings of that. So I use that in my paintings as well. Very cool. My most popular paintings are these little dancer paintings. These little, these little dancer paintings, which are done just on campus board. Um, I, I, I fork out about 20 of them because so many people like them. Just like these little, just spontaneous, um, quick uh, paintings. Yeah. So I got about 12 of them sitting just on top of each other. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just really, really like uh, drawing people and, um, uh, gestures and and things like that so those are some of my paintings that i'm working on right now Very cool yeah. well i just want to let the audience know you can browse leah's work on facebook at leah thompson originals and you can also purchase her work through um, the Taubman museum of arts online art sale at shop.taubmanmuseum.org half of all sales support the museum and the sale is up through august 31st and you can also find her her work on fineartsamerica.com and pixel.com. I've always been drawn to working with my hands and engaging in all the tactile nuances of creating a tangible object or seeing physical results of manual labor. I've been really drawn to the medium of metal because while it is so malleable, it demands a fierceness of labored intention. Because the materials are valuable and no one wants to waste or ruin metal, much less one of a kind stones or organics. And this medium is exciting because it is so vast that I never feel like I've mastered much, but in a good way, in the way that makes room for constant growth and consistent learning within this craft. It is also exciting to be part of furthering traditions and upholding trades that have foundational roots in almost every culture. I think my biggest dream for Kamershai Cove is just to keep showing my heart and my work and forging it into metal and embracing the small the tiny scale, the literal magic of every living thing, just being there, present, tiny yet significant, purposefully alive and marvelously crafted. It is enough, and so are you. I have always been notorious for having collections of natural things and can barely go on any walk without tucking a treasure of some sort in my pocket to bring home. From feather collector to beachcomber, it comes as no surprise that I find absolute delight in the raw materials of this medium. As a biology student, I was always drawn to the micro details that echo the realities and functions of much larger ecosystems. 
And this search for microcosms has really stuck with me and shows its face often in my work. I utilize a lot of rough cut gemstones that just give a little more rugged appeal and can more closely resemble these landscapes and terrain out in the natural environments that I'm wanting to emulate and find deep inspiration in how they become uncovered and reveal all of their character and depths of formation. Within my collection, I also have a series focused on kinetic movement with rotating organics pinned inside protective frames or hinged beneath sturdy forms to emulate that tactile quality of found object discovery. Because I love how the natural world rewards curiosity. My newest collection is a study of seeds and seed pods and features crushed gemstones set inside robust hulls of silver having survived the winter. While all seeds are of value, I liked the idea of putting precious gemstones inside as seeds. This is, to me, just part of an adventure in a visual way of just being curious and being open-minded to see surprises. Often it is the smallest details that kind of give a sense to the bigger scope of life and both its resilient strength and its beautiful frailty. And who can't relate to that dichotomy? It has become my voice that I've been forging into metal for over 10 years now. Thanks for joining me for this Museum Minute. We're in the back administrative offices of the museum right now to give you a sneak peek on one of the most recently acquired works in the museum's permanent collection. This piece by Daniel Hesedens was gifted by collector Mitchell Caniff along with three other pieces at the time. Mitchell noted that when um, one of the things that really attracted him to this work is the, the balance of um, a paint on the canvas, the way that the, the heat uh, and light pulls through on the colors, and the heavy brush strokes that really add to a very dynamic composition. This piece, although um, somewhat realistic, is also very abstract uh, and really reminds us of a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. It'll be on view in the museum's upcoming exhibition, highlighting the last 10 years of recent works to our permanent collection this fall. So make sure to mark your calendar and come in um, to see it in the galleries in person. Joining me is Ivan Bellavo owner and winemaker at Bellevue Farm. So tell me a little bit about the farm. Um, it is 165 acres. It is on the boundary of Craig County, Montgomery County, and Roanoke County. It's a high mountain area. We have a high mountain vineyard there, and we have a brewery and a bed and breakfast. We also have several lavender fields, which is my wife's passion. And they're absolutely gorgeous. I saw them on Facebook, and it's just absolutely beautiful work you all have done out at the farm. Thank you, thank and you. And so you actually, you're the winemaker for the farm Yes, well. yes, okay. I am now the winemaker. I started off hoping to do that many years ago and it was nice that I could actually grow my own grapes and make my own wine. It's nice when dreams come true. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So tell me a little bit about what we're tasting today. We have two wines, we have many more, but these are two that I thought are distinctive. Um, the first one is a Cabernet Franc Merlot, it's called Sunset Sipper. And all our um, logos have beautiful um, pictures that were painted by a local artist. Her name is Sandy Grubbs. And so this wine is, is uh, got lots of fruit, particularly uh, dark fruit. It is, uh, because it's a Cabernet Franc Merlot, it is a classical right uh, bank 
Bordeaux blend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, sm I taste that kind of strong that the Bordeaux carries. And also has a smoky flavor. It definitely has a smoky yeah. flavor. It also has this like fresh earth mm -hmm. aroma. Mm -hmm. And as one of our tasters a couple days ago mentioned, he felt it was like a mahogany library. <laughs> That's the perfect description. <laughs> <laughs> And then our next one? This one is a Cabernet Franc, and it's called Fireside Chat. Again, the same picture of a beautiful fireplace, and a different picture, but, and this one is 100% Cabernet Franc. This is a bold red wine. Mm -hmm. It is really meant for a, a nice steak, um, or a hearty lasagna, something like that. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is okay on a porch, but it's definitely better with food, whereas the Sunset Sipper, is okay on a porch. It's actually quite nice on a porch and goes very well with lamb mm -hmm. and pork chops. It's got a great like mouth flavor afterwards. It kind of lingers. It is absolutely yeah. lovely. It's delicious. Yes. I keep on going back so I'm going to put myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank and you. I'm so grateful um, because the farm has also gifted us a little thing that we can share with you. So um, we're looking forward to having an overnight stay at the bed and breakfast, which includes breakfast. And it is a $280 value. So all of the details are in the comments section. So in order to kind of enter to win, you, you can um, comment and share our um, event throughout this weekend and we'll announce the winner on Sunday. Thanks so much for joining us, Ivan. Thank you for having me. Hey everybody, um, I'm Brian Murphy. I am an artist. Um, I live in uh, Virginia. I live in Newport News, Virginia in the Hampton Roads area. And um, I am just here to say hey and this is my outdoor studio. I'm plein air painting today. Um, I am at one of my favorite local locations down by the James River. Um, I actually just finished up on a 12 by, little 12 by 12 piece. And, um, you know, I, I, um, you know, I have a studio in town as well, <clears throat> um, but I just, you know, feel the most comfortable when I'm outdoors painting and I get the most, um, you know, real satisfaction, um, from my, my plein air work. So, um, you know, I'll take you through the process a little bit and, um, we'll keep it kind of brief, but, um, I, you know, I, I, I could share a, a whole tutorial with you, but I, I don't think people really want to take the time <laughs> to see all that. Um, so I'll just kind of take you through the process. Um, first, first off is finding a good location. Um, on a hot day like we've been experiencing, all these 90 degree days, it's good to have a little shade. Um, and um, let me take you down a little closer into my painting. So again, we found a nice location. Um, got some nice tree coverage here. Uh, we're down by the James River. And I started this painting, you know, a couple of hours ago, possibly a little less, but, um, you know, laid in the groundwork with a, a little simple wash, um, kind of a brown wash, and did a quick sketch and then kind of went to work on um, actually adding some real paint to the um, to the canvas so this is what i have accomplished so far and um, with plein air work i kind of like to keep it fast and kind of furious and just kind of get it done don't overthink it um, probably add a little shadow in the water underneath the, the um, boathouse out there. Um, aside from that, I, I like the spontaneity. I think the color is good. We caught some nice sunlight earlier um, and some nice clouds in the distance. So that kind of filled in a, a, an interesting sky. And we are about done with this particular painting. Um, I've used French easels for years when I do my, my plein air work, just 
I find it comfortable. I can fit a lot of the supplies right inside the easel itself. Um, I work with a somewhat limited palette, not extremely limited. I've got about seven colors there. Um, been kind of working with the same colors for years. And depending, you know, on the situation, I will I'll use board stock. Uh, this is a um, a prefab artist board with a canvas with a, a linen covering. So it, it gives the texture and the feel um, of canvas, but it's also easier to transfer it when you're traveling and, and painting um, on site. So it's um, always fun to get outside and get, um, get out with nature and see true color and true shadows and um, get back to my roots. My, um, my early painting days were in Southern California and I started out just strictly plein air painting. I, you know, I could count on the weather and I could get out there on a regular basis after my day job and I could paint and not worry about the weather changing and I always have beautiful scenery. So it was a great, um, it was a great, uh, you know, learning process to be um, on the West Coast and kind of one of the, um, uh, you know, one of the painters out there when the plein air movement was really starting to, um, resurge, have a resurgence back in the early and mid 90s. So I won't bore you too much with um, the rest of my art history, but um, you can visit my website at bmurphy.net. I am also on Instagram, Brian Murphy Artist, and then you can find me on Facebook as well. Uh, we're doing virtual shows in this virtual world we're all trying to navigate, um, and until we can do some actual art festivals on the ground. Uh, we'll have to make do with what we have here. Um, I hope you can all check out my website, look at the other artists uh, involved in the show here, and um, you know, support the arts. It's, it's been, it's been a, a rough time for a lot of people. I know a lot of um, artists that I, I know do art festivals and our business has pretty much come to a standstill. So. It's always nice to find clients, new clients, old clients that are buying online. Um, so again, you know, support the arts, support your local artists and not so local. And, um, you know, I hope to see all of you at a festival, an art show, an event um, when we can all breathe a little easier and get back to normal. So uh, this is again, Brian Murphy signing off. Um, thanks for um, tuning in. Bye bye. Now is glass artist Colette Gordon. Her business name is Neptune Hot Glass and she's based out of Salina, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today and welcome Colette. Oh thank you, glad to be here. Yeah so um, your work is, is stunning and just really quite mesmerizing to look at and I'm excited that we're going to get to see a demo video of yours um, and some le learn more about the process of your work. Okay, what I'm doing is this is our furnace. It's run, it runs on electricity and I'm working at 2100 degrees here. The consistency of the glass is like molten honey, if you can imagine. So I stick in a rod called a punny. I pick up the glass and now I'm rolling it in the color. My husband and I work together. We collaborate or sometimes we work separately. He was just tapping off some of the color. This is a glory hole that keeps the glass fluid. And I'm putting a little bit more color on it. That's a close up. He's tapping off the excess. And this thing is called the Marver. You use it to shape the glass. Now I'm sitting at my bench and I'm cutting the glass with a butter knife. It's that soft. It's in preparation. This is the interior of the piece. You have to keep rolling it. You have to keep it on center and you have to keep it symmetrical. I have a special little tool that's like a mini Marva that I'm flattening it keeping the shape. Now I'm picking up a couple, a couple of the parts. That is 24 karat golden dichroic glass that I just put on there. And I'm tapping it with my mini marver. 
to keep it uh, on the piece. And uh, I have to keep it symmetrical. I have to keep it turning. And that's a close up of me patting the, the parts into the piece. I pick them up and then I pat them in, but I can't let it cool off too much or else it may explode. That's the thing, you have to keep it warm, but not, not liquid, but pliable. Put it back in the glory hole to keep it warm. And I put some of my parts on. You'll see these in the finished piece. These we pre-make and we spend about a third of our time making these really intricate pots out of glass and out of glass threads that we make ourselves. Those are called orbs. So I'm rolling it, keeping it symmetrical. And now I am putting it back in the glory hole just to keep it pliable so it doesn't explode. That uh, machine is at about 2,600 degrees, so it keeps it hot. You'll see I added another piece. I'm patting it down. And I'm cooling it just a little bit. Now I'm making a bubble. I use an ice pick and I poke inside the orbs, which are pliable, to make a bubble. Because it makes Nicola, it air space. Do you turn it to keep it from like folding on, on itself? Is that why you keep turning it? Exactly. So that's a nice shot of the furnace. We have a nice pneumatic door. Now I'm dipping it in clear glass. And it has to be exactly the right temperature when you do this because you don't want it to melt in there and you don't want it to be too cold that it's going to explode. So I turn it a quarter of a turn. There's the molten glass on top of the piece that I already made. And I'm turning it, like you said, so it doesn't fold over. Keep turning, keep it symmetrical. I go back to my bench, set it down on my rail. And I'm hanging it to make it a little bit longer. It's actually dripping off the punny at this point. And I'm watching it. I want to make it a little bit longer, so I'm hanging it down a little bit. And you can start to see the pieces inside of the uh, molten glass. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm going to do another dip. It cooled off sufficiently, then I'm going to go back in. I'm going to make it bigger. Every time you do this, you make it bigger. Okay, so I pull it out. Ever have to worry about when you dip it in, having the pieces that are on the inside melt? Uh, that could happen real easily if you have it at the wrong temperature, if you hang in there too long. Gotcha. So that is my husband. You can see his feet, basically. <laughs> and he's turning it, and I have these cork paddles where I'm flattening the piece. So cork is good because it doesn't leave any uh, marks. You can see it flames up, but it doesn't leave any marks whatsoever. And on the bigger pieces, we'll collaborate. Sometimes I'll help him, sometimes he'll help me. But I'm working on a shape, I'm making an asymmetrical piece. And uh, it is a medium sized piece I'm making. And I keep shaping it, I'm twisting it a little bit. It's nicely, the cork is nicely burnt in, so it sort of takes on a shape. And he was helping me turn it because sometimes you have to concentrate on the piece. If you're turning it and doing all this, it, it's good to have an extra set of hands. I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, Barry makes a lot of symmetrical pieces, so I help him. And that's a little different process, but it's basically kind of the same tools. So I'm really working on it there. And Barry is swinging it because it's, I went and I got it hot again, so we're making it longer. And that's how you do it. You, you use uh, oh, some wow. of the boss. And uh, see, it's gotten quite a bit longer there in that piece. Okay, so I'm taking it back. And it's got a little bit of a twist in it. Now what I'm doing is this process is called making a jack line. Those are jacks and you squeeze where the glass is off the pipe. You make a line all the way around with those. You go around usually three times and you saw it in, you get it nice and cool, but you gotta watch it because you can't let it slump. It's still really hot. And uh, the thing is you can't let it get cold because it's gonna explode. But you, you know, the more you work with the glass, the, the more used you are to get to working with it. You know, the more you know how it's gonna behave. So that's a close up of the piece. It's asymmetrical, it's got a twist in it. Now what I'm doing here is that little blob of glass that's still on the pipe. You have to keep it warm because it could shatter. 
and uh, I'm going to put it back in the glory hole for 10, 10 seconds to 20 seconds, depending on the size of the bees. Just get it nice and warm so the whole thing's uniform. I'm going to go back and I'm going to work on that jack line a little bit more. And my husband is rolling a piece for me. At that point, it's pretty hot. You can see I've got a glove on because yeah. it's close to my hand. But usually I don't work with a glove. But a big piece, I'll put one on. And I keep soaring. I keep that jack line nice and hot. Okay. And now I'm at the point where I have a knife. And I have a little water on it. And I saw at it. So it's thermal shock. If all goes well, I do this a couple of times. That little jack line gets really weak. And the next thing I can do is break it off. And this is a nest. I just broke it off. My husband has gloves on, he stands it up. And this thing to the, is, to the left of me is the anila. We open it, we put the piece in there. It's a little raggedy on the bottom, so we gotta be careful. We shut it, and that is the finished piece right there. And so is, the, the, what you put it into, was that a, a, like a freezer? Actually, it was like a, it's like a warming oven, a big, big, big oh, warming okay. oven. It holds the glass at 950 degrees until we're ready to run a program. Then what it does is it ramps down. It goes down very gradually. You know, it goes from 900 to 800. Then it goes from 800 to 740. And uh, it goes down very slowly. Thing on the piece, it's anywhere from five to two days about, you know, considering how big they are. Right. And it takes it down carefully so it doesn't shatter. The inside doesn't shatter. Because we put gold, sometimes we'll put titanium, we'll put precious metals, platinum in the pieces. Yeah. So we're really kind of pushing it about what you yeah. can do because you got to be careful about cooling temperatures. Right. And uh, that's the process pretty much. And then the next thing we do, which is kind of mundane, you know, kind of boring, is that we grind down the bottoms or sometimes the big pieces will facet them, we'll grind and facet them. And mm -hmm. uh, those pieces sometimes are, you know, collector's pieces that, uh, you know, that are about a foot or more. And uh, right. that's a longer process, but uh, yeah, the cold working is not very interesting. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever had a piece actually explode on you? Oh yeah. Uh, we do this process sometimes where we'll dip the piece in cold water before we're done with it and we'll crackle the outside of it. And sometimes we'll put a facet on it. So we have rough and shiny. And uh, that's really tricky. You count three seconds and then you pull it out, then you put it in the heat and you just Keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is that uh, if a piece is, if it's not right inside the anila, that could explode inside the anila. And mm -hmm. uh, little pieces of glass get on the pieces and sometimes they're seconds from that. But fortunately, that doesn't happen very often. And of course, when I was learning, there were a lot of pieces that ended up on the floor or that oh. they didn't make it or... But it's, it's about, it was about a two year process every day for me to learn. First thing yeah. I did, Barry taught me. He, I assisted him and then I did some small pieces on my own and I worked out, so. What made you want to switch over to glass? Uh, I kind of got hooked on it. And uh, Barry's brother was in the business with him. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly. He had a heart attack about, uh, about 16 years ago. And it's, uh, there's some glass workers that work by themselves but what we do it really takes two people and that's a pretty small shop yeah so i i kind of liked it to begin with and then barry taught me how to make glass and when scott was alive sometimes i'd go in and i'd goof off with the guys and we'd fool around and i'd make simple pieces and they'd help me but i really really do like it and i was needed and um it was uh, a change of career but not really because i'm still an artist I like right. it because it, it's, it's physical and it's a little dangerous and it's dramatic. I still like making jewelry, but I think I like glass a little bit better. It's fun. So, yeah. For me. So, um, you mentioned that you have a couple of finished pieces that you'd like to show. I do. So, let me see if I can. This is wow. a piece. This is currently on our website here. Okay. And it's a little hard with glass, but you know, as I was saying, you can see the two orbs. 
You can see the gold on it, all the parts and pieces. These are Marini. These are really small pieces that we make that we, if you can imagine when I picked up the glass, we pick up glass and we put colors and we stretch the glass out the length of the shop. And then we chop it up into small pieces. And then we can pick those. So it's a Venetian technique. We work, there's two schools of glass. There's the Italians and there's the Czechs. And uh, we use primarily Italian techniques when we work. This is one of my husband's pieces. This is berries. And same thing, you can see the 24 karat gold, the Marini, two nice big orbs. And uh, you have sort of an idea of what we do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, I do the asymmetrical pieces for the most part, and Barry does the round ones. And we do pieces that are a lot bigger, and we do a lot of the faceted pieces too. So there's some yeah. of them that are on our website, so you can see them. So. Yeah. Well, Colette, thank you so much for sharing um, your, your work with us and talking about your creative process. Um, is there anything else that you'd like the audience to know about your work? Um, just that uh, we were going to do your show this year. This was the very first time we were really looking forward to it. Yeah. And uh, hopefully next year, you know, the shows will be back. And I'm looking forward to meeting all of you that are watching me. Well, I wanted to let our audience know that you can browse Colette's work on her Facebook and Instagram at Neptune Hot Glass and on her website at NeptuneHotGlass.com. And you can purchase her work through the Taubman Museum of Arts online art sale, which is the is shop.taubmanmuseum.org. And half of all sales supports the museum, and the sale will be up through August 31st. Printmaker from Bryport, Virginia, and I've been doing this for about 30 some years. I went to Averett College in Danville, Virginia. I do two types of printmaking, and this is my art shed. So, welcome to my art shed. Hi, these this here is this is a limited edition print, what you call a sheen clay etching. It's done on a zinc plate and I've done a process called sheen clay where I've added oriental papers into the printing process. This is another etching and this one is called Fancy Feast for Cats. I'm a cat lover. I have five cats. They're all indoor kitties and this is like they're having a feast of their own on the dining room table. Etching. And this one is called Alice's Wonderland, the gardener. And the gardener is a crow. Also has the Cheshire cat up in the tree. I love gardening, uh, so I've tried to incorporate the, my fondness of flowers and animals. This is also a Shinkalay etching, which I have done with the Oriental paper on her outfit. And I've hand colored with Prismacolor pencils. One of the most popular prints. It's called Mad Hatter's Tea Party 2 Series 2. It has Alice and also the rabbit. And he's with the Mad Hatter, who's actually forcing the mouse into the teapot. Now I'm going to show you a couple of my plates for color graph printing. And this is called a color graph plate, which I've made with different types of wallpaper and also laces. This is a plate, it's called Footloose and Fancy Free. And we have a cat and a rabbit in a flower garden. And she's me dancing in the flowers. And this is what I print from. It's called a colograph. All right, now I'm going to show you a couple of colographs. This one is called Blue Heron Posing in His Glory. This is also done with wallpaper textures. 
and different types of grades of wallpaper here. Cut out all the feathers by hand with an exacto knife to make the flip. I'm going to show you one more holograph. They're called monoprints because each one turns out differently when it's printed. This is one of my favorites here. This is called a garden angel. Study one and some chicle on her outfit here, which is cut out oriental papers when I do the printing process. Also, this plate has lots of lace patterns and textures, pressed flowers, which are in some of my prints. I want to show you a few of the things that inspire me in my work. These, if you look at these leaves in the white, they are just a skeleton of leaves that are left in the fall. We have a lot of oak trees, and I love taking these and putting these in my cold graph plates that I make. And sometimes I print these just as an individual print. I use a lot of uh, Queen Anne's lace. These out on a plate. Then I go back and put them on a plexiglass plate I roll ink and then I press them down and pull them off after they go through the press and I get a negative image of the Queen Anne's lace. I'm inspired by birds. You see a lot of birds in my work. You see a lot of birds in the color grass. I love frogs. I have a water garden. Thank you for joining us. I had a blast. What about you? I had such a good time with you all. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. And we want to thank our sponsors. The event was presented by American National Bank and Trust and with lead sponsorship by Blue Ridge Beverage and additional support by Lindor Arts. And don't forget, if you found something you liked, go on shop.tobinmuseum.org, browse the listings and all sales uh, benefit both the museum and the artist. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 1 p.m. to continue the virtual sidewalk art show at the Taubman Museum of Art.